let's welcome back to the program entrepreneur and adventurer and environmentalist Dick Smith. Thanks for joining us again, Dick. Good to be here. Um, nuclear energy, you're an advocate. Why? Ab absolutely. Look, when I was 22 years of age, I was in England as a backpacker and I did a tour of the Dungeness nuclear power station. It was humming away and uh, in those days it was not a big deal. We thought the world would just go all nuclear. Unfortunately, it didn't. So many environmentalists around the world now are looking to nuclear. So sometimes from environmental groups or pedigrees that used to be very anti-nuclear. Um, what's driving that shift, do you think? Well, I think just the, the practical side that, look, there's a claim at the moment which is made by the CSIRO here and AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator. They say that renewables, they say that wind and solar with storage is cheaper than coal. Now, it's not true. And because of that lie, and it's a lie, we're going to delay moving to something that we have to move to, which is nuclear, because you need a baseload power. Renewables are too intermittent to run a whole country on them. Well, this is important, and, and you're a big advocate for renewables and for the use of electric cars and, and, of course, protecting the environment, but you simply can't do it, can you? You can't store the amount of energy you need to in, a, in an efficient yeah. or effective way. It's absolutely impossible. Look... About two years ago, if we talked about having nuclear submarines, we would have thought it was impossible. But thank heaven, someone from the military rang the Prime Minister and said, Prime Minister, there's no alternative. Now we need someone to ring the Prime Minister and say, there is no alternative. You, no one has run a country totally on renewables. It's impossible. Well, that's what I kept coming back to in this debate, just the inevitability of, uh, of things changing. Because, as you say... Uh, we know renewables can't work. Otherwise, every country in the world would be doing it. And In fact, most yeah. countries are getting into trouble like we have, as they've done in Germany and yeah. other parts of Europe, because you just can't do it. Unless you have a massive amounts of hydro, like Norway or Tasmania, you yep. can't live, survive on renewables. You're absolutely right. But when you've got two government institutions that we should rely on for accurate information giving disinformation, that's very difficult for any politician. You just heard one politician comment and uh, he's saying that nuclear is too expensive. It's, it, first of all, it's not going to be the cheapest form of power, but if you're going to move away from coal, you're going to have to actually pay more. I dare I say that. Yeah, if you're pre <laughs> we're paying an enormous amount now in all sorts of ways, including lost opportunities by trying to go to renewables and creating an energy crisis. If there's a premium to be paid for having emissions-free electricity, isn't that a premium that most environmentalists would want to pay? You'd think so, but it's interesting. Uh, friends of mine who are environmentalists about my age are all anti-nuclear. I can't, it's like a religion with them. They're completely opposed. And I think they were brought up like I was. Maybe they didn't have the chance of going into a nuclear power station. But we thought of the uh, atom bomb and uh, we linked the two together, as your documentary showed. And so you've got... Older Australians against it. Fortunately, my grandchildren are not as biased and they think it should be looked at because they are the ones who are going to suffer if we have problems with climate change. I think there's no doubt about that. There was the Cold War, the fear of a nuclear war that drove it a lot for, for people uh, of my generation and, and yours. And, and there's also Chernobyl in the... In that would have been the mid to yeah. late 80s, uh, created a lot of fear. But younger people seem to understand the technology. They're not frightened of the technology and they're prepared to at least have this debate. Well, surely. thank heavens. But look, look at France. I mean, it's got 50 nuclear power stations. It's over 70% nuclear power. It has been for over 40 years. Now, where does the best champagne come from? Well, it's actually grown all around nuclear power stations. So if you get the French to build it, it's going to be very safe. Just don't get the old Soviet Union to build your nuclear power station and you'll be OK. Well, exactly. We're wanting to repair our relations with France at the moment. Anthony Albanese's overseas. <laughs> we sort of had to uh, scrap their submarine contract. We ought to commission them to build a nuclear plant for us. You could do that or you could get the Koreans. They're building a nuclear power station in the United Arab, Arab Emirates at the moment. It's Two of the reactors are going and churning out, humming away, giving out electricity without any carbon. So it can be done, but it's going to be really difficult here when you have the CSIRO and the AEMO telling porkies. Telling porkies about renewables plus storage being the cheaper solution, it's even that, though we don't have that it's storage. It's certainly not true. By the way, why don't, why don't you challenge them and ask them to, to come up with the design that they're going to be able to run where you've got... See, some stage you can have a, a wind drought where you don't have wind for four or five days. Exactly. Or even if you design the, the system with the present knowledge of wind and sun, and then we had some strange weather conditions that we haven't had before, which could happen, 
suddenly what, the whole country closes down? You can't do that. This is what happened in uh, Britain uh, earlier in the year. They said what they called it a wind drought. And this is the point. I think their defini definition of storage limits it to about two hours or whatever. Yep. And as you point out, if you're relying on solar and on wind, you need storage. You might need storage for a week. Who knows? Yep. What about the Sun Project? You know, this is the one which is going to send power from Northern Territory... To Singapore. To Singapore. Now, I just simply... I don't know whether they're actually telling... Uh, whether this is a joke or whether it seems it's factual. preposterous. Because I've been to the Northern Territory, to that area where they're going to put the solar cells. I've been there when we've had a week of cloud cover. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to tell the Singaporeans, oh, because they've only allowed about a day's worth of battery storage, so you'd have to tell the Singaporeans, oh, we're going to sell you this electricity, but, by the way, at different times when we can't tell you, for up to a week we won't be, won't be able to supply any power at all. As if Singapore would do that. So what should we do first in Australia? Should the no. federal government at least get rid of the legislation banning nuclear energy just to see what uh, the absolutely, market... Absolutely, absolutely. What, what about the hypocrisy? We're the third largest seller of, new, of uranium in the yep. world. We have the biggest uranium mine in the world. Now, I've been down into that mine and I can tell you, people talk about where are we going to store the waste. Well, in that mine where the uranium comes out, I've driven down in there. Yep. There's yep. huge, Big... great caverns where you could stack the nuclear waste up. At the moment, by the way, we store the nuclear waste at Lucas Heights. Yes. But you could take it across to the, to the Olympic Dam site, store it there, the safest ground. place in the world. It, it would be indeed. Thanks for joining us, Dick. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Dick Smith there, entrepreneur, adventurer and environmentalist.